Hello there. My name is David Ives. I'm the executive director of the Albert Schweitzer Institute here at Quinnipiac University, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome uh, everybody to this uh, conference. I have some housekeeping uh, chores to do before I, uh, before I launch into my remarks. Um, we've, been, we've, we've been planning this conference entitled Building Up or Breaking Down the Future of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty for several, several months, and we're grateful that all of you came and to our speakers, and they'll be introduced throughout the day. Um, I would like to point out that for everybody in the general audience, we're having a lunch for you up in up near where you registered. So feel free to hang around and and uh, and and uh, have a have a nice little lunch that's up there. Um, and also the bathrooms are up near the registration uh, booth area, so you should feel free to go uh, and use those when you need to. The um, there's a great deal of materials over there to the right, um, some from the Schweitzer Institute, many from the Global Security Institute, uh, that are extremely uh, important and well written and give you a whole, uh, a very good idea of what the what some of the issues are related to nuclear weapons and nuclear testing. So please feel free to take them and and uh, and hopefully read them later. Um, I'd like to thank the law school for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, the Schweitzer Institute and the, and the law school have been looking for ways to cooperate in the, uh, since the Schweitzer Institute came on campus. And uh, we're pleased now that we have two major projects, this one with a, a nuclear weapons and also some work that we do together in Nicaragua in terms of humanitarian values. I'd like to thank Brad Saxton, the dean of the law school, for his support for this. I really would like to also thank Jeff Meyer. Where's Jeff over there? for his, his work uh, on this. And I'd like to thank my director of programs, Aaron Peck, who's sitting in the back there. You have to wave higher than that. There you go. <laughs> who did a lot of work um, for this also. And especially the ones that did the most work was the Law School Human Rights Club. So I would like to thank them. And I would ask that any, all those that are here from the Human Rights Club, uh, the law school, to please stand and be recognized, or at least raise your hand or something over there. There's three over there. And, couple over there and say thank you to them. Um, my remarks will be will be brief, but I wanted to give you a context uh, for this for this whole program. The Albert Schweitzer Institute has been a part of Quinnipiac University for a little over eight years now. In that time, the Albert Schweitzer Institute has grown extensively in terms of its programs and has become pretty well known on an international basis. We have sent over 500 students and faculty on humanitarian trips to Nicaragua and Guatemala and Barbados and Gabon, where we have built school classrooms, water systems, and gardens, along with training teachers in culturally appropriate teaching methodologies, providing occupational and, and physical therapy for disabled people, helped small businesses grow their businesses, and worked with veterans troubled by post-traumatic stress syndrome. We also have organized conferences at the UN on peace in Central America with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and conferences at Quinnipiac with the 1991 Nobel Peace Prize laureate Rigoberto Menchu on racism, gender issues, and the problems facing indigenous people. And with President Carter on the 50th anniversary of Dr. Dr. Schweitzer's call for an end to nuclear testing, among many other things. However, one of the most important things about which Dr. Schweitzer is not well known, as I, th as I think he should be, is his opposition to nuclear testing and weapons, and hence this conference. It is my pleasure and honor to represent Dr. Schweitzer, the 19, 1952 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, on an international basis. He was known as a prominent theologian, philosopher, and an expert on the organ music of Johann, Johann Sebastian Bach. Indeed, he gave many concerts and lectures on these subjects throughout Europe, throughout his life, and I often compare his fame to that of Bono, of the rock group U2. Indeed, at a summit for Nobel Peace Prize laureates in Paris last year, I told Bono that he reminded me of Schweitzer due to his excellence in music and his dedication to humanitarian values. His response was, cool. <laughs> Very extensive conversation. <laughs> However, Schweitzer left all of his fame in Europe when he decided to become a medical doctor and work in what is now the country of Gabon, and what was then, at the beginning of the 20th century, French Equatorial Africa. He lived and worked in a town called Lamborghini for 50 years and even became more famous for his humanitarian example in Africa and for what he felt was his most important contribution to the world, 
the idea of reverence for life. From the German, I understand that the word reverence translates more accurately to the English word awe, which conveys a sense of wonder for all life, plant, animal, and human. It is tough to kill another human being if you think of another human being with a sense of wonder and amazement. However, in 1957, Schweitzer decided through the influence of his friend Albert Einstein and Norman Cousins to strongly oppose nuclear testing and nuclear weapons. With the help of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee and Radio Oslo, he delivered three radio addresses broadcast throughout Europe in which he described in detail the problems of nuclear testing. I think we all need to be reminded of the horror of nuclear war or even an explosion of one of these weapons since most people I feel are very complacent about these awful devices. An ex excerpt from his radio address follows. The explosion of an atomic bomb creates an inconceiv inconceivably large number of exceedingly small particles of radioactive elements that, which decay like uranium or radium. Some of these particles de decay very quickly, others more slowly, and some of them extraordinarily slowly. The strongest of these elements cease to exist only 10 seconds after the, after the detonation of a bomb. But in, but in this short time, they have killed a great number of people in a circumference, circumference of several miles. Of these elements, some exit for hours, some for weeks or months or years or millions of years, undergoing continuous decay. They float in the higher strata of air as clouds of radioactive dust. The heavy particles fall down first. The lighter ones will stay in the air for a longer time or come down with rain or snow. How long it will take before everything carried up in the air by the explosions which have taken place until now, no one can say with any certainty. According to some estimates, the earliest this will be will be 30 or 40 years from now, and Schweitzer was speaking in about 1957. <coughs> Schweitzer was not only concerned about nuclear fallout, but, but the moral implications of a, of a decision to use nuclear devices. He quoted an English MP who said with good reason, he who uses atomic weapons becomes subject to a fate of a bee. Namely, when it stings, it will perish inevitably for having made use of its sting. He who uses atomic weapons to defend freedom would become subject to a similar fate. Later on in his life, he commented on the fact that the world came close to nuclear war over the Cuban Missile Crisis and over the construction of the Berlin Wall. In an open letter to the United States Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, Schweitzer, who was very concerned that McNamara had been given authority to, authority to launch nuclear strikes in response to the Berlin crisis, writes the following. A war fought with atomic weapons is something so horrible that not even military people or the scientists concerned with the real significance of atomic weapons can have a full notion about it. First of all, it no longer has the character of war. War up to now has meant that through the use of weapons, Territory can be conquered or can be defended against enemies. A war with atomic weapons is very different. During such a war, no territory or fortress can be conquered, nor can any territory or fortress be defended. The only possibility is mutual, senseless, unlimited destruction. This destruction will take place over vast, territor vast territories and far over the borders of combatants because of the terrible explosions, fires, and a terrible poisoning of the atmosphere and soil. A great part of many populations will, po will perish woefully. Atomic war has nothing to do with two, natures, two nations, but with the whole of humanity. Other Nobel Peace Prize laureates have chimed in to support the elimination of nuclear weapons and have specific recommendations to make. At a summit of Nobel Peace Prize laureates in Guangzhou, South Korea in 2006, the laureates made the following statement. If we are to have stability, we must have justice. This means the same rules apply to all. Where this principle is violated, disaster is risked. In this regard, we point to the failure of the nuclear weapon states to fulfill their bargain contained in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to negotiate the universal elimination of nuclear weapons. To pursue a nuclear weapons-free Korean Peninsula or Middle East or Southeast Asia without credible commitment to universal nuclear disarmament is akin to a parent trying to persuade his teenagers not to smoke while puffing on a cigar. There are steps available to make progress in this area and they include 
One, completing a treaty with full verification mechanisms cutting off further production of highly enriched uranium or plutonium for weapons purposes. Two, universal ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, now ruled ratified by 176 nations. Three, taking the arsenals of Russia and the U.S. off hair trigger, launch on warning high alert. Four, legally confirmed pledges by all states with nuclear weapons never to use them first. And five, making cuts in the U.S. and Russia's arsenal irreversible and verifiable. Returning to, to Schweitzer's radio addresses, he concludes one of them by saying the following. The awareness that we are all human beings together has become lost in war and through politics. We have reached the point of regarding each other only as members of people either allied with us or against us. In our approach, prejudice, sympathy, or antipathy are all conditioned by that. Now, we must rediscover the fact that we all together are human beings and that we must strive to concede to each other what moral capacity we have. Only in this way can we begin to believe that in other peoples, as well as in ourselves, there, there will arise the need for a new, new spirit, which can be the beginning of, feeling, of a feeling of mutual trustworthiness towards each other. Schweitzer goes on to say, and remember this is 1957 and the words are still applicable today, that, quote, it would become of immense importance if the United States in this hour of destiny could decide in favor of renouncing atomic weapons to remove the possibility of an eventual outbreak of atomic war. The theory of peace through terrifying an opponent by greater armament can now only heighten the danger of war, unquote. I am pleased and proud that President Obama is finally paying attention to what to Schweitzer's call for an end to, new, to the dangers of nuclear war and testing. However, I am not at all pleased that there seems to be momentum building now to, bu to spend billions of dollars on making a new generation of nuclear weapons, even while trying to eliminate them. I am considering going one step farther in supporting countries like Costa Rica and Malaysia, which have called for a new nuclear weapons convention entirely to address these thorny issues. However, today I hope that all of you will join me and the people on the various panels to make sure that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty builds up and does not under any circumstances break down. Thank you. One more housekeeping detail before I introduce our keynote speaker. Um, Henry Lowendorf is here. Can you wave Henry? And Henry has some petitions over there to be signed that are anti-nuclear weapons in, in, in nature, but you can read them when you're there. So thank you for, if you want to see them at some point. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. Uh, I first met Jonathan in Rome at a summit of Nobel Peace Prize laureates about six years ago, and Jonathan was running around trying to make sure the summit went well and still had time to make comments to me and uh, sh show his interest in me as a first timer there. Actually helped me get on the dais and give a speech, which I really appreciated at the time. Um, Jonathan is an attorney, author, and international advocate emphasizing the legal, ethical, and spir spiritual dimensions of human development and security with a specific focus on advancing the rule of law to address the threats posed by nuclear weapons. He is the president of the Global Security Institute, senior advisor to the American Bar Association's Committee on Arms Control and National Security, and the co-chair of the American Bar Association Blue Ribbon Task Force on Nuclear Nonproliferation. He is senior advisor to the Nobel Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Laureate Summit, and has served as vice president and UN representative of the Lawyers Alliance for World Security. He serves on numerous governing and advisory boards, including the American Bar Association International Law Section, Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy, the Fortune Forum, the Jane Goodall Institute, the Bipartisan Security Group, and the Middle Powers Initiative. Just a few things that he does. I personally have learned a lot from Jonathan about the issue of nuclear nonproliferation, spirituality, and I hope you here today will feel the same way. Without further ado, I'd like to present my friend, Jonathan Granoff. Well, I think that was an adequate keynote, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to begin with some quotes from Albert Schweitzer as well, because I think that he is uh, truly a compass point uh, for 
morality for our time. Man is a clever animal who behaves like an imbecile. Let us dare to face the situation. Man has become Superman. He is Superman because he not only has at his disposal innate physical forces, but also commands, thanks to scientific and technological advances, the latent forces of nature, which he can now put to his own use. However, the Superman suffers from a fatal flaw. He has failed to rise to the level of superhuman reason, which should match that of his superhuman strength. He requires such reason to put this vast power to solely reasonable and useful ends, and not to destructive and murderous ones. Because he lacks it, the conquest, conquests of science and technology become a mortal danger to him rather than a blessing. So it is, it is uh, appropriate that the law school uh, and the Albert Schweitzer Institute should partner in this because it is precisely this problem that he addresses uh, as a moral dilemma uh, that needs to be addressed at, uh, with a legal solution. There is no military solution to dealing with the threats posed by nuclear weapons and uh, it is not sufficient to just have the sentiment which we've heard expressed by the President of the United States, that we should get rid of them. We need the tools of morality and law to actually accomplish this task. And that's why the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is so important and why it is a worthy focus of our discussion today. But before we get to the treaty, I want to put some humanity into the subject matter. Um, Schweitzer said, we've talked for decades with an ever-increasing light-mindedness about war and conquest as if these were merely operations of a chessboard. So I'd like to begin by reading some of the testimony of the mayor of Hiroshima, Mayor Hiroaka, when he testified before the International Court of Justice, which in the 1990s addressed the issue of the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons. The mayor said, the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki shattered all war precedent. The mind-numbing damage these weapons wrought shook the foundations of human existence. The dropping of the nuclear weapon is a problem that must be addressed globally. History is written by the victors. Thus, the heinous massacre that was Hiroshima has been handed down to us as a perf perfectly justified act of war. As a result, for over 50 years, we've never directly confronted the full implications of this horrifying act for the future of the human race. Hence, we are still forced to live under the enormous threat of nuclear weapons. Beneath the atomic bomb's must, monstrous mushroom cloud, human skin was burned raw. Crying for water, human beings died in desperate agony. With thoughts of these victims as the starting point, it is incumbent upon us to think about the nuclear age and the relationship between human beings and nuclear weapons. The unique characteristic of the atomic bombing was that the enormous destruction was instantaneous and universal. Old, young, male, female, soldiers, civilians, the killing was utterly indiscriminate. The entire city was exposed to the compound and devastating effects of the thermal rays, shock wave blasts, and radiation. Above all, we must focus on the fact that the human misery caused by the atomic bomb is different from that caused by conventional weapons. Human bodies were burned by the thermal rays and high temperature fires broken and lacerated by the blast and insidiously attacked by radiation. These forms of damage compounded and amplified each other and the name given to the combination was A-bomb disease. The bomb reduced Hiroshima to an inhuman state utterly beyond human ability to express or imagine. I feel frustrated at not being able to express this completely in my testimony about the tragedy of the atomic bombing. It is clear that the use of nuclear weapons, which cause indiscriminate mass murder that leaves survivors to suffer for decades, is a violation of international law. In a book that's recently been re uh, released called The Last Train from Hiroshima, um, there's a very 
sort of a, I think this is a very graphic and compelling description of an eyewitness uh, testimony. <clears throat> the author describes the so-called ant-walking alligators that survivors saw everywhere, where men and women who were now eyeless and faceless with their heads transformed into blackened alligator hides displaying red holes and indicating mouths. The alligator people did not scream. Their mouths could not form the sounds. The noise they made was worse than screaming. They uttered a continuous murmur, like locusts on a midsummer night. One man staggering on charred stumps of legs was carrying a dead baby upside down. I, I recently was in Hiroshima uh, at the Peace Center and met with the current mayor, uh, Mayor Akiba, who is the head of a Mayors for Peace initiative which now has over 3,000 cities. In fact, the United States Conference of Mayors has endorsed their program, uh, which for the mayor from Akron, Ohio, is their spokesperson. I mean, we're talking uh, mayors who realize that their cities are, are targets and they don't like it. And it's, it, I mean, it's striking to me that the pornography of the trivial that dominates our media doesn't give publicity to our own mayors. And, Thus, uh, and thus we don't have a, a overflowing audience here uh, because the issue is really neglected. But in Hiroshima, it's not neglected. And um, I went to a service while I was there where well, in a Buddhist center once a month on the 6th of each month, they remember the people who passed uh, on August 6, 1945. And the uh, the, the Buddhist priest who, who ran the place told me uh, his own personal story in which he said that uh, he was about 11 years old when the bomb went off, and that morning he had gone into a tunnel to play with some of his friends. And when he came out, everything was gone. It was very compelling to me, because there I was in the city that he was talking about, that just a short while ago, I mean, it was just, he said everything was gone. All of his family was killed. His friends were all killed. But it was just in an instant. You know, in that one day, he went in. The city was a, it was a beautiful, sunny day. And he came out, and it was all gone. And that night, I walked the streets of Hiroshima. Now, Hiroshima is an amazing experience. And I would encourage everyone to go there as a pilgrimage, as a pilgrimage to the, to the transformative moment of our time. And what I saw was a vibrant, dynamic, creative city. People were, it was, and it's totally safe. It's one of the safest cities in the world. And people are out, to, it's, like, it's like a European city and the people are out till very late. And there's a whole section of the town with restaurants and clubs and nightclubs. Very creative and it's a very dynamic business community. And I would read from wise people that one should see the divine in the ordinary daily lives of our daily life, you know, raising a family, having a job, just getting up and being human to your neighbors as really an expression of something very exalted. And Albert Schweitzer wrote extensively about this point, about seeing, uh, about seeing the divine in everyday life. And I had never, I I'd, I'd intellectually had wanted to see it, but I saw it for the first time in Hiroshima. I saw that these people had faced the um, had faced the, uh, the visage of, of hell. They'd faced what hell is and had chosen life. And I just found that to be so inspiring. And it reaffirmed my commitment to this, uh, this which I believe to be the essential litmus test of our time. Uh, that term was conveyed to me by then Senator Robert Kennedy, when I was interning in Washington in the 1960s, and he spoke to a bunch of interns and told us about what really happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis and how close we came to destruction. And he said it was the moral litmus test, moral and practical litmus test of our time, that if we fail on this issue, all other issues fail. So when the World Court addressed the issue, it addressed what the mayor of Hiroshima ended his testimony, calling it a violation of international law. And what the court said was, that the court was divided as to whether under all circumstances the use of a nuclear weapon would be illegal. It said it was generally illegal, but they couldn't decide whether it would be illegal of a, of a country in a state of absolute uh, existential threat, that, it, that an absolute ex, ex, exigent circumstance. Um, and under such circumstances, they, they said, however, that, uh, that there was an 
an absolute need to comply with customary humanitarian international law, which prohibits the use of a weapon incapable of distinguishing between combatants and civilians. Um, it must adhere to the principle of protecting neutral states, um, that it must be proportionate to the attack that the state has suffered, it must not cause permanent damage to the environment, nor unnecessary suffering. So one of the judges objected to that decision and said he couldn't see, Judge Wiramontri couldn't see that any use of a nuclear weapon could possibly be compliant with all this. And the British lawyers argued, well, well hypothetically, you could drop a bomb as a depth charge in, in, the, in the oceans or in the Gobi Desert somewhere, but that's not really the way that the weapons are targeted. They're targeted at cities. And they're targeted at, at people. And, uh, and it's simply impossible to control uh, the, the radiation, the fallout in space and time. Uh, so it's impossible to protect neutral states. It's impossible to distinguish between combatants and civilians. Uh, so the court was divided on, 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 on the principle that international law so, so fundamentally rests on the importance of the state, keeping the state as an entity. So the way the court resolved it was they unanimously agreed that there was a duty to negotiate to completion illegal instruments or instrument abolishing nuclear weapons. And um, that's, the, that's, that's the state of the highest court in the world's pronouncement on the subject. And um, I think it's, it's been, you know, neglected. It hasn't been argued, it hasn't been debated in the public in the United States, nor has the fundamental morality of nuclear weapons. Most of the dialogue we hear is, we have to make sure that the bad guys don't get the weapons. Uh, even people like Sam Nunn, who's come out for nuclear abolition, speculates uh, that what drives him is, if, a, if, if there was a bomb used on an American city, he, he said, well, what, he said, he was, thinks, what, what could I have done to prevent that? But the fundamental issue for me is, the willingness of anybody, whether they're Russians or Americans, to use this device that, that I'm worried about what would happen the day after we would use it and kill hundreds of millions of innocent people. What would we be as a country? What would we be as a people? What would we be as a civilization? I mean, what does it mean to be focused on your nation's security? I get my gas from a Russian concession. Uh, when my computer doesn't work, I'm on the phone with a kid from Bangalore, and our money is backed up by debt, by loans from China. Uh, we, you know, my shirt was made in Malaysia, and we live in one world, and the idea that we would risk all and everything, well, let me state it the way George Keenan, not known to be a left-wing radical uh, band the bomber, the uh, American diplomat who originated the Cold War containment policy to the Soviet Union, George Keenan said, the readiness to use nuclear weapons against other human beings, against people we do not know, whom we've never seen, and whose guilt or innocence is not for us to establish, and in so doing, to place in jeopardy the natural structure upon which all civilization rests, as though the safety and perceived interest of our own generation we're more important than everything that has taken place or could take place in civilization. This is nothing less than a presumption, a blasphemy, an indignity, an indignity of monstrous dimensions offered to God. Uh, that's George Keenan. And I find that kind of moral, uh, moral testimony, for me, very compelling. And that uh, the nuclear venture is uh, I think that we need to start focusing not on the possessor of the weapon uh, so much as the nature of the weapon itself. The nature, the weapon is so extraordinar extraordinarily horrific, it remains abhorrent in anybody's hands. Um, let me give an example of how I think of it, and, uh, and, and I, I think you might find this clarifying. There is a, 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 a treaty banning biological weapons, <clears throat> universally banning biological weapons. Now imagine if that treaty said that polio and smallpox are banned and prohibited from anybody, anybody's use. But there are nine countries 
that are so responsible, moral, and trustworthy that we will allow them to use the plague as a weapon to maintain international peace and security. Well, obviously that would be morally incomprehensible, but it would be practically incomprehensible. It would be unsustainable because of its lack of equity. Because human beings, talk to any seven-year-old about the nature of fairness, and they'll tell you, you have to be fair. You have to treat other people the way you want to be treated. And if you don't treat people the way you want to be treated, you have a problem. And that's the underlying problem of our current dilemma. But there is a treaty that, in a sense, addresses this problem. It's called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it, it really is a, a, a marvelous uh, instrument. It, it arose because the intelligence estimates during the 1960s reported that by the end of the 70s, there would be 25 to 30 states with nuclear weapons integrated into their national arsenals and ready for use. The treaty came into force in 1970, and I just want to pause for a second. That's when Richard Nixon was president, and the INF treaty that wiped out an entire class of weapons was negotiated by Republican leadership. The Chemical Weapons Convention was negotiated by Republican leadership. The START treaty, Republican leadership. The, the, the fact that we have reached a partisan impasse on arms control now is a distortion of the historical record. Historically, oddly enough, enormous amounts of progress were made during Republican administrations. And I remind all of us that Ronald Reagan was a nuclear weapons abolitionist. So the idea that progress on arms control, nonproliferation, and disarmament is a partisan or a Democratic Party uh, issue is really not historically accurate. So the treaty came into force in 1970 and has effectively constrained proliferation. Because of the success of the NPT, we've escaped a nightmarish alternative world in which dozens of nuclear weapon states make every local issue into a global crisis. And Ambassador Thomas Graham Jr., who led the U.S. negotiating team in 1995 at the Treaty's Review and Extension Conference said in, ex in, in explaining the core bargain, in exchange for a commitment from the non-nuclear weapon states, today 182 nations, not to develop or otherwise acquire nuclear weapons and to submit to international safeguards intended to verify compliance with the commitment, Article 2 of the Treaty, the NPT nuclear weapon states promised unfettered access to peaceful nuclear technologies, nuclear power reactors and nuclear, uh, nuclear medicine, Article 4, and pledged to engage in disarmament negotiations aimed at the ultimate elimination of their nuclear arsenals, Article 6. During the negotiations that created the NPT, several prominent non-nuclear weapon states, Germany, Italy, and Sweden, for example, refused to allow the treaty to be permanent. And so they argued that after 25 years, the treaty needed to be reviewed to be determined whether it would be indefinitely extended, extended for a, a period of time, or terminated. So in 1995, all 100, then 187 parties to the treaty came together and negotiated the extension of the treaty. An indefinite extension was obtained, but of course, like any bargaining, there, were, there was a quid, quid, quid pro quos. And part of that bargaining was contained in the, what were called principles and objectives of nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament. And these were if, if, if politically binding commitments of all of the states. And these were promises that the United States made to induce the indefinite extension of the treaty. And these included a comprehensive test ban treaty, an affirmation of our commitment to pursue nuclear disarmament, commence negotiations uh, for a treaty to stop the production of nuclear bombs materials, sharply reduce global nuclear arsenals, encourage the creation of nuclear weapons free zones, vigorously work to make the treaty universal by bringing in Israel, Pakistan, and India, enhance IAEA safeguards, 
and reinforce the negative security, the assurances to non-nuclear weapon states that they would not be threatened with nuclear weapons. Additionally, it was committed that every five years the treaty would be reviewed to be determined whether these commitments toward disarmament were being fulfilled or not. So in 2000, which was the first review conference, I would say that was a high water mark, and it really it was a, a, a landmark, successful international conference in which 13 practical steps reaffirming many of the statements that were made in 95 were reaffirmed. They also added, the which you'll hear later about today from some of the technical experts who are here. And by the way, David, I want to commend you in really bringing an extraordinary group of experts. I mean, this is, this is a conference. I, I live and breathe this issue. This is a conference I would have come to just to hear some of the other people that are here. I'm looking in this row right, right here with Nick and John and Hans and, and, uh, and, and Maya. I mean, these are, these are people that I would, I would come to hear. Uh, I mean, you have the top, top people. Um, so, in, in, uh, in 2000, another very important commitment was also made, the principle of irreversibility to apply to, to nuclear disarmament, so that the idea was that the cuts that are taking place between Russia and the United States should be made ir irreversible. And uh, language that even strengthened the statement of commitment to disarmament, quote, an unequivocal undertaking by the nuclear weapon states to accomplish the total elimination of their nuclear arsenals as per Article 6. So that it wasn't just the pursuit of the ultimate elimination, but it was an unequivocal undertaking to accomplish it. What do we have now? We have in the world today, Russia has between 13 and 14,000 nuclear weapons. The United States has between 10 and 11,000. China has about 130. France around 300. The United Kingdom around 160, Israel around 80, India 50, Pakistan 60, North Korea maybe 10. So you can note there that there's two countries with about 95% of the arsenals. And let me remind you that the arsenals, the size of the arsenals, the, the kind of weapons we're talking about are not, not the size of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Most of the arsenals are, are most of the arsenals are, are are, are, you know, are the trigger, the, General Lee Butler told me that the triggering devices on most of the weapons are the size of what was in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So Hiroshima and Nagasaki was about 15,000 tons of TNT, 15 kilotons. We have bombs in the megaton range now, million tons. Most of the bombs are between 150 and 300 kilotons, which is 10 to 20 times the size of Hiroshima. And, uh, we have no idea what would happen to the climate if a few hundred of these went off, but m many scientists are saying that that would basically end civilization. So when you, when you talk about these numbers of the you know, tens of thousands of them, over 20,000 of them, it, it just boggles the imagination that we would continue this venture at the cost last year of over $50 billion to keep the arsenal going. And when, the ins when you realize the inspection regime of the IAEA has never spent more than $130 million in a year to do all the inspections in the world, and we spend more than that a day, we, the United States alone, on the nuclear arsenal, it's really shocking. Um, but. I, I, I think that we need to go back to the, the moral and existential threat of the weapons, not just the complexity of the treaties, not just the, uh, uh, the great danger that, that entities, terrorists, or, or, or state, some states that couldn't be deterred could get them, but the very danger of their very existence. The, I call it the oops factor. Oops, we forgot about that. It, and it is simply, well, let me quote General Butler, who was, in, who was in charge of uh, the targeting and readiness at one point of the whole arsenal. Uh, he was uh, commander of the U.S. Strategic Nuclear Forces during the 1990s. He says, it's more chilling than anything you can imagine. That's a quote. He notes a litany of near catastrophes, missiles that, quoting him, missiles that blew up in their silos and ejected their nuclear warheads outside the confines of the silo. B-52 aircraft that collided with tankers and scattered nuclear weapons across the coast and into the offshore seas of Spain. A B-52 bomber with nuclear weapons aboard that crashed in North Carolina. 
and on investigation it was discovered that on one of those weapons, six of the seven safety devices that prevent a nuclear explosion had failed as a result of the crash. There are dozens of such incidents, nuclear missile-laden submarines that experienced catastrophic accidents and now lie at the bottom of the ocean. In 1995, there was a weather satellite sent off the coast of Norway, and the Russians were told that this was a weather satellite, but it didn't go up the command and control. So when it went off, it looked like it was a Trident launch, and the, and, uh, and the message was brought to then President Boris Yeltsin that Russia, Russia was under attack, and he, he had less than 10 minutes to make a decision as to whether this was a mistake or, 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 or an actual attack, in which case the, the, the Russian arsenal could be under attack. The, this, their fear would be that the first volley would hit their weapons, so he'd have to shoot them off before they got hit. And he had very little time. Thank God he wasn't drunk. And thank God the trajectory became clear that it was not headed toward Moscow. It was just a weather satellite and not a Trident launch. On, on June 30th, U.S. command posts indicated, uh, June 3rd, 1980, U.S. command posts ind indicated a Soviet attack. Launch crews for Minuteman missiles were given preliminary launch warnings and bomber aircraft manned. This is, we were talking like less than a 15 minute time period. Computer displays showed two missiles attacking, then none, and then 200. A simple computer chip had malfunctioned. Recent mishaps should cause continuing concern. For example, on August 30th, 2007, a US B-52 bomber was mistakenly armed with six nuclear warheads and flown for more than three hours across the United States without, without sufficient command and control supervision. On October 19, 2007, the Department of Defense and Air Force released a report that concluded handling standards and procedures had not been followed. Subsequently, four commanders were relieved of their commands, numerous personnel were disciplined, and in the wake of this and other incidents, Secretary of Air Force Michael Wynn and Chief of Staff of the Air Force General Michael Mosley resigned. Think of India and Pakistan and the level of command and control that they have. And we are all downwind. And we know how diligent American armed forces are in protecting these materials. And they are diligent. And yet human errors are part of the human condition. We are not supermen, as Albert Schweitzer opined. Uh, e e even under the best of circum... Oh, and such incidents are not unique to the United States. On February 3rd, 2009, the Vanguard, a British Royal Navy nuclear submarine, and Le Triomphant, a French nuclear vessel, collided in the Atlantic Ocean. Both carried nuclear warheads and were on routine patrol. Defense officials said they were unable to see each other. And they just had a collision. They made a mistake. Ray Ronald Reagan admitted, quote, six minutes to decide how to respond to a blip on a radar scope and decide whether to unleash Armageddon. How could anyone apply reason at such a time? And that's the situation that we have today. And it is simply not realistic, nor really moral, to think that by accident or design, these weapons won't eventually be used as long as they exist. And the most powerful stimulant to them is the fact that the most powerful nations claim that they need to have them for their security. Now, the arguments against progress on disarmament, I think, have become strange and burlesque. One of the arguments we're hearing now from those who extol the virtues of nuclear weapons is that if the United States makes progress on the disarmament agenda, it will stimulate proliferation amongst our friends and allies. And uh, so, I mean, that's truly Orwellian, and it is completely belied by the facts. Uh, the, they ignore uh, uh, Westerwell, uh, Germany's foreign minister, uh, who called for the, recently called for withdrawal of all, all NATO nuclear weapons from German so soil within four years to make progress on the disarmament agenda. He said it would set a good example when it comes to disarmament. 
or Japanese Prime Minister Yukio Hatayama praising President Obama's global disarmament initiative went further by suggesting that Washington forswear the use of nuclear weapons except in response to a nuclear attack. Such a no first use posture would dramatically lower the role of nuclear weapons in military planning. And I had the privilege of meeting with Foreign Minister uh, Okada in December in Japan and found out that he had actually drafted, when he, before he came into office, he had drafted a model treaty on making Northeast Asia a nuclear weapons free zone and is encouraging parliamentarians in his country to work with parliamentarians in South Korea and, uh, and, and make progress on that. Uh, additionally, he wrote a letter uh, which is, uh, uh, there's a press conference today in, in, uh, in Tokyo, uh, and he wrote a letter to uh, Foreign Minister, uh, for, to Secretary of State Clinton, uh, stating clearly uh, Japan's encouragement of progress on disarmament. So I wonder what these countries are that people like Senator Kyle are saying will become nuclear weapon states if we make progress. I mean, I I'm waiting for them to actually name names instead of just creating irrational fears and um, lies, frankly. These are lies. The, the, the facts contradict the statements. And, uh, and yet they, go, they remain unrebutted. Uh, because we, we, we really just don't have, we don't have uh, a sufficient platform for these issues. Um, even the Nobel laureates uh, have, have a hard time getting this message out. And I want to read from, I'll, on my conclusion here, I'm going to read from what the Nobel Peace Laureate said in uh, what the Rome Declaration uh, uh, on this subject. Actually, I'm going to put a graphic up before I read what they said and then uh, and tell an anecdote. Recently, um, David and I were in Berlin. Uh, we were in Berlin at the last summit of the Nobel Peace Laureates. And I, I had the privilege of being asked to be on a panel with uh, Willem de Klerk. Oh, okay. Yeah, you put it up. All right. Willem de Klerk and uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev which is, you know, pretty, pretty cool, right? I mean, uh, so I said, uh, on behalf of maybe billions of people, President de Klerk, for your courage in standing up and tearing down the horrible wall of racism and apartheid, and your courage in doing that, God bless you and thank you. And President Gorbachev, in this room today, there are many people who've made history, but it's fair to say that you saved history. And the night before, they'd had these huge celebrations. Hillary Clinton was there, and all these heads of state and from Europe were there celebrating the, t the, f the taking down of the Berlin Wall. And, uh, and I got to say uh, to President Gorbachev, you know, thank you for your courage in helping to tear down that wall. And then I said, and now it's time. And then I had, th I had this, this uh, blown up into a, a banner. Uh, seven by 14 feet that came out was was held aloft by the students from uh, from the University of Heidelberg, and there were several hundred students in the audience because there were celebrities there, and uh, <coughs> and uh, they came out with this banner, and then I got to say, and now it's time to tear down this wall, because this wall represents a wall on the planet Earth, where. On Monday, we're asking countries to forsake short-term economic opportunity for long-term environmental responsibility to protect the global commons. If one country can dump in the oceans, everyone can dump under their flag. We need a universal norm to protect the oceans, to protect the climate. We even found in Davos discussion two years ago when the people wanted to discuss controlling the global casino, uh, it, derivative instruments and betting on currency transactions and all of that, they were laughed off the stage. But now that is the discussion. How do you control the global casino? How do you set global norms for the financial markets? So, and, and, and we know the Millennium Development Goals will not be met in addressing the immoral and gross disparities of wealth on the planet unless we have global norms and, and an international regime. This is impossible to address our, the, the, the needs of Main Street, Wall Street, and No Street, and to address protecting the global commons of the living systems we depend upon, the oceans, the climate, on Monday. And then on Tuesday, explain to 
all but nine countries that they're second class security citizens, that, that, that we claim a greater right to security with, and, and to brandish these weapons than they have. I just don't see how the cooperation can be forthcoming unless there's a norm, a norm on security. That unless we start really living up to the principles embodied in the UN Charter, unless we, unless we move in that direction. And, it's, and the business community is there. That's the, ir that's the irony, especially for people who are confirmed leftists who think that money is distorting everything. The fact is the business community has woven together a global, global legal regime that is actually working. You can franchise anywhere in the world. You can have a letter of credit in Kuala Lumpur and be completely certain that it's going to be honored here in, uh, here in central Connecticut. We have, uh, the, the, the lawyers of the world uh, have helped create a truly cooperative, functioning system of communications, of travel, and of finance and business. And so when people say, oh, it, how would we do it? Well, it's already taking place. Where it hasn't taken place is in the minds of military planners and in the minds of the bureaucracies and businesses that have an interest in perpetuating this madness. But the person on the street understands that we are certainly not existential enemies of Russia. I mean, does anybody here realize, I mean, the, 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 that we are... We, are, we have the ability, not the ability, we have the training, we have people trained to be willing upon orders to annihilate all of the people in the major cities of Russia in a, in a half an hour. And they similarly have people trained and have weapons pointed at us right now. In a half an hour, could all be gone. It sits over our heads. And we're not existential enemies by any stretch of the imagination. China. China, China, we, we are, they have no economy without us. They're our bank. So the Nobel laureates said, we Nobel Peace laureates and laureate organizations gathered in Rome, Italy, have for years been deeply disturbed by the lack of public attention and political will at the highest levels of state paid to the need to eliminate nuclear weapons. There are over, at the time, there, 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 there are over 22,000 of these devices threatening civilization with over 95% in the hands of Russia and the U.S. This danger threatens everyone, and every person must work to eliminate this risk before it eliminates us. We oppose the proliferation of nuclear weapons to any state. We're faced each day with a new crisis in proliferation, exemplified by concerns regarding North Korea and Iran. However, our focus must be on the weapons themselves, for the only sustainable resolution to gain security is the universal elimination of nuclear weapons. The failure to address the nuclear threat and to strengthen existing treaty obligations to work for nuclear weapons abolition shreds the fabric of cooperative security. A world with nuclear haves and have-nots is fragmented and unstable, a fact underscored by the current threats of proliferation. In such an environment, cooperation fails. Nations are unable to address effectively the real threats of poverty, environmental degradation, and nuclear catastrophe. Nuclear weapons are more of a problem than any problem they seek to solve. In the hands of anyone, the weapons themselves remain an unacceptable, morally reprehensible, impractical, and dangerous risk. The use of a nuclear weapon against a state without nuclear weapons is patently immoral. Use against a state with nuclear weapons is also suicidal. These weapons have no value against terrorists or criminals. Progress toward a safer future is not thwarted from a lack of practical threat-reducing options. The problem is a lack of political will. As Nobel Peace Prize laureates, we commit to work collectively to achieve the elimination of nuclear weapons, which we believe are unworthy of civilization. We've heard the impassioned warning from the mayor of Hiroshima and the survivors of the atomic bombs and join with the thousands of cities around the world, including Rome, calling all nations 
especially those with nuclear weapons, to immediately commence negotiations to obtain their legally verifiable elimination. In past years, we've set forth practical steps, which David so amply set forth, the test ban, de-alerting, uh, strengthening IAEA safeguards, for example. We issue a serious warning that without such efforts, the nuclear test ban treaty, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty could corrode opening the way for dozens of states to become nuclear armed, a frightening prospect. The NPT is a bargain in which nonproliferation is obtained on the promise of nuclear weapon states to negotiate the elimination of the weapons. There is a fundamental dilemma which must end. Nuclear weapon states want to keep their weapons indefinitely and at the same time condemn others who would attempt to acquire them. This is unsustainable. The current situation is more dangerous than the Cold War. We're gravely concerned regarding several current developments, such as NPT stakeholders enabling rather than constraining proliferation, modernization of nuclear weapon systems, the aspiration to weaponize space, thus making arms control and disarmament on Earth more difficult, and the declared policy of terrorist organizations to obtain nuclear weapons. Given the critical nature of the situation, we pledge to challenge, persuade, and inspire heads of state to fulfill the moral and legal obligation they share with every citizen to free us from this threat. As Nobel laureates, conscience requires us to raise our voices, inspire humankind, demand change. And we call upon the citizens of the world, that's you and I, to join in this work. So I want to conclude and just say that the nuclear weapon, when you look at the technology of it, it is mysterious and wondrous beyond imagination. That particles that can't be perceived with your five senses, that make up the very building blocks of matter, that hold the fabric of the form of the mystery of creation together, when split asunder, release power unimaginable to the human mind within one one thousandth of a second, three times the heat of the face of the sun, that this power is in human hands, people with no more wisdom than the person sitting next to you, Machines which we have created upon which we now de depend to prevent these devices from being used. The mystery, I believe, that gave us the power to unleash this kind of destruction, I believe has also given us the power to control it, to work together, and to use the gift of science and technology to bring us to the point that Albert Schweitzer so powerfully said, reverence for life. That is even more mysterious, in my opinion, and more powerful than the gifts of science and technology. And that begins, that reverence for life begins in every one of our hearts. And I believe if that reverence is awakened in anybody, one of the first issues they're going to want to work on is eliminating the arrogance of brandishing nuclear weapons. And I pray that we become those people who have that reverence for life and step forward with the Nobel Peace Laureates and people like Albert Schweitzer and get rid of nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. <laughs>